Sister Mitchell, for filling in that space. I forgot some of my notes in, in the office. And I went in the office to get them. And then I left my Bible. <laughs> so don't want to preach without a Bible. All right, so let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. We're going to continue our study in Revelation 7. On last Sabbath, we covered the seals of Revelation 7. Today we will look at the 144,000. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, again we thank you for another opportunity to come together to study your sacred word. We ask as always for the Holy Spirit to be with us, to be our guide and to be our teacher. I pray, Lord, that my life would be hidden in Christ and in God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as I mentioned already, we looked at the seals, the seal of God on last Sabbath, and we made some interesting uh, discoveries in the Word of God that the seal of God is not a literal seal that can be seen on our foreheads, but it's an experience with God. It's a transforming experience with God that leaves us changed and transformed. Uh, into a new person. And we discovered that God's seal is, can be found in the fourth commandment uh, of the Decalogue. And in that Decalogue, God's seals contain his name, title, and territory. The Lord, your God, the creator, and his territory is heaven and earth. He made all these things. And so when we look at the commandments of God, the Lord said, we were looking at the Rechabites on last Sabbath, and we discovered they had a sign, they had a seal with their father, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, because they kept his instructions by not building houses, by not drinking wine, and by not uh, 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 living in houses and so forth. And so God has given us a sign. And in Ezekiel chapter 20, in verse 12, uh, he says, moreover, also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a what? To be a sign. And we discovered on last Sabbath the word sign and seal can be used interchangeably. The word mark, you know, we talk about the mark of the beast, but God's seal is his mark. You know, the word seal, mark, sign, all these things are used interchangeably. So the Lord says, I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. And so just like everybody knew who the Rechabites were because of their behavior, because of what they did, everybody should know that you belong to God because, or to the Creator because you hollow and keep his Sabbath. Amen? Amen. Here's another one. Ezekiel 20, verses 19 and 20. I am the Lord your God, he says. Walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And hollow my what? Hollow my Sabbaths and they shall be a sign between me and you that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. So this is what God wants. And so today we're going to be looking at the 144,000 the Israel of God, the Israel of God. And when we talk about 144,000, you know, when we read the passages in Revelation, and if you will turn into your Bible there, Revelation, Revelation 7, and um, I'm going to begin reading in verse 4. 
And it says here, John says, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So remember, chapter seven is an interlude, an interlude. There was a question asked at the end of chapter six about all this destruction that was happening on the earth. And then the Lord Jesus Christ was on his way back. He's coming. And the question is being asked, who shall be able to stand? And so the whole purpose of chapter 7 is to answer that one question. And God is saying to the angels, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree, until I have sealed my servants in their foreheads. And now, John, we're transitioning to verse 4 and through 8. And now John says, and I heard, I heard, is what he said, the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So the first thing people want to know most often is when you start talking about the tribes of Israel, is this literal? Is this literal? Are we talking about the literal tribes of Israel? Well, the first thing we have to understand is this. In 722 B.C., the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, got dispersed by the Assyrians. And they were scattered all over the world. 722 B.C. Are you with me? And so that left two left. And now it's in the south. Judah and Benjamin. And so... Is this talking about liter the literal 12 tribes of Israel? Most of those tribes intermarry where they were. By the time you get to the time of Christ, the Samaritans who were always fighting with Israel, that was a mixed breed of, of half Jew and, and um, I forget who else they were mixed with. I, I, it's escaping me right now. But again, they intermarried where, wherever they went. And so is this talking about literal Israel? And we're going to discover that it is not. And then the other thing people want to know right away is, is the number literal? Now, I could do a sermon and show you both sides of people that say it is literal, and I can do show you the people that say it's not literal, it's figurative. But it's not necessary. <laughs> it really is not necessary. The main thing that we have to know about them is, their character, their character. What is it about them? They have received the seal of the living God, which is what we want to do here, yeah? amen? amen? Who wants the seal of God in their forehead? We all want that, we all want that. So we are to strive to be a part of that group, whether that number is literal or whether that number is figurative. And most people worry about it, and I understand it, because you say, wow, there's seven and a half billion people on the planet and only 144,000 literally are going to get this. And so this is why it's always in the back of people's minds. So I want to go to the screen and I want to show you what the prophet says about this. And this is first selected messages, 174, paragraph 3. She says, it is not his will that we should get into controversy over questions which will not help them spiritually, such as, who is to compose the 144,000? This, those who are the elect of God will in a short time know without question. So pretty soon we're going to find out. We'll know in a very short time, and you will know in a very short time whether or not you're one of them. All right, and then here's another quote. Signs of the Times, September 24, 1896. It says, shall we not rather strive to be among that number? of whom John writes, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Now, that's a clue right there for you. Are you keeping the commandments of God? And if you are, all of God's commandments, you're on a good path already heading in that direction to be a part of the 144,000. Because this is an identifying mark of who they are. They keep the commandments of God, all of the commandments of God. They don't throw any of them out. They don't say, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, this one's not important. You know, this one was nailed to the cross and that and the other. They say, oh, no. 
They keep all of the commandments of God that he wrote with his own finger. And they live them and they believe in them. Are you with me? So since the 144,000 are identified as Israelites, um, it's very, uh, uh, most of the times it's in the minds of the people to quickly assume that God will again establish literal Israel. Now this is, in a, this is a popular doctrine that's in the Christian world. And I was taught this growing up that, oh, the Lord is going to reestablish the nation of Israel over there in Palestine. The temple is going to be rebuilt. And Jesus is going to come and he's going to sit on, you know, the throne of David. And there's going to be a thousand years of peace, a millennium of peace. And this is a very popular teaching in the Christian world. And so that's why you see so much pro-Israel, especially here in America. We have to stand with Israel. We have to stand with Israel. And it's so funny, we have to stand with Israel even though they don't accept Jesus Christ. And the, 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 the prevailing thought or the prevailing thinking is we have to stand with Israel no matter what they do. And the reason why they think that is because they say that God has made some promises to them and God cannot break his promises. Can God lie? No, he can't lie. But what they fail to realize is that those promises are conditional. They're conditional. If I were to say to Brother Herman, I said, Brother Herman, if, if, if you come over here and you, you take my phone and, and hand it to this brother here, and I'll give you $1,000. And he runs up here to get that $1,000. He grabs the phone. And then he goes back and he sits in his seat and he starts scrolling. And then he says, oh, preacher, you owe me $1,000. Did he do what I asked him to do? The covenant agreement was, hey, you need to take this phone and give it to my brother over here. But if he goes and he sits down with it and he starts playing games on it, am I obligated to give him $1,000? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. These promises, these covenants are conditional. And I want us to look at this a little bit this morning if we will, if we, if we can. Well, well, I'm sure we can, because we're going to. <laughs> Amen. So there's this prevailing thought. And so, um, and, and the other teaching is this, that the church will be raptured out of here before all of this happens. And so the church will be long gone, and then God is going to reestablish Israel so he can fulfill all of the promises that he made to them. And, and they teach that this is the fullness of the Gentiles coming in. And after the fullness of the Gentiles come, oh, they're going to be raptured out and they're going to be gone. And then Israel gets a chance to be reinstated. And there's a lot of this going on, a lot of this teaching going on. And it's commonly believed that Israel was reestablished in 1948. Uh, when they were brought back into Palestine, they pushed all those people off their land. And they say, oh, now we have reestablished the nation of Israel in Palestine. And they have been fighting back and forth ever since. And so we're going to look at this this morning. So first thing we need to do is we need to understand what a covenant is, what a covenant is. And so we're going to look at how God made covenants with Israel and what the agreements were. And we're going to look and see whether or not those agreements were conditional. So I'm not going to do a sermon this morning telling you whether or not the 144,000 is literal. I'm not going to do a sermon this morning trying to figure out, well, who's going to be a part of the 144,000? Because as we can see, that's not important. We should strive to have the character of the 144,000. Are you with me? So turn with me in your Bibles. And we're going to look at how the Lord made a covenant with Israel. So go with me in your Bibles to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. 
And we're going to look at how the Lord made a covenant with a man by the name of Abram. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. Amen. Amen. Sam's ready to go. Amen. Genesis chapter 12. And notice what it says beginning with verse 1. And it says, Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall the families of the earth be blessed. And it says in verse 4, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abram was 70 and 5 years old when he departed out of Haran. So here we see the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So again, a covenant is simply an agreement between two parties. And in order for that covenant to be in effect, both parties have to keep their end of the bargain. If one party breaches that covenant and does not do what they said that they were going to do, it's null and void. It, it sets the other party free. Are you with me? And so in this right here, we can see Abram's part and we can see God's part. Simple instruction. Abram, I want you to leave your kinfolk. I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave where you were raised and I want you to just leave. Didn't even tell him where he was going. And he set out and he started doing what God said do. And the Lord says, you're going to go to a land that I will show you, but I need you to and he did it. He packed his family and his nephew Lot said, hey, man, where you going? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> and he says, I want to go too. He says, come on. And he packed his family and they all left, not knowing where he was going. And God says, if you do this, I will make you a blessing. Your seed will be as the stars in the sky. He says, and I will curse those that curse you, and I will bless them. So this is God's part. So did Abram do what God said? He, got, he did it. So now is God obligated to do his part? Absolutely. And we're going to see that God did do it. God did do it. So it's very interesting. Now go with me now to uh, Deuteronomy. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. To Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. This is when the Lord was telling Abram and his wife, oh, you're going to have a child, and they're well stricken in age. And so, and, and it became quite comical to Sarah. But then the Lord was also going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. So go to Genesis chapter 18, and notice what it says with me, beginning with verses 18. And we're going to read verses 18 and 19. Notice what the Lord says about Abram. He says, seeing that Abram shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him and then what the lord says about him he says for i know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the lord and do justice and judgment that the lord may bring upon abraham that which he had spoken of him so some time has passed and the promise has not been fulfilled because Sarah couldn't have kids. And of course, you know, they messed up, you know, and they tried to help God out. And, uh, you know, they went through that whole thing. But the Lord says, no, the promise is going to come nonetheless. The promise is going to come nonetheless. Now go to chapter 22. We're just going to kind of peruse through the scriptures a little bit this morning. Genesis 22. And notice what it says in starting with verse 15. Genesis 22, we're looking at the conditionality of these covenants. Uh, Genesis 22, verse 15, are we there? And it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy, uh, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, 
and the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of, the, of his enemies. Verse 18, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. You see that? So this is a story when after he finally has a son, uh, he finally has a son, then the Lord tells him, I want you to take him on Mount Moriah and I want you to sacrifice him. After all that time, the Lord says, sacrifice him. He said, man, and he obeyed the Lord. He obeyed. And the Bible called Abraham the father of the faithful because whatever the Lord told him to do, he would do it. Now, he made some mistakes along the way, and we highlighted those. But when the Lord, he, had, he came to the conclusion that the promise has to happen. So even if I kill Isaac, the Lord is going to have to raise him back up from the dead because he said the Messiah is coming through this boy. That's how much faith he had in God. And in the book of Hebrews, it highlights that. He said he counted God faithful that he could raise him up again. And that's what he did. So he was going to do it. And the angel stopped him so that he didn't have to do it. And so the Lord says, because he did what the Lord told him to do, in this instance, the Lord repeated the promise, in blessing I will bless thee. And then you're, you're going to have your seed is going to be as the sands on the seashore. Very interesting. Now listen, let's go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. And we're going to look at the conditionality of the covenants. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Is the 144,000 literal Israel or did God work out another plan? Deuteronomy 7, and when you're there, please say amen. We're going to begin at verse 6. Amen. Verse 6 says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all the people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath that he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed thee out of the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth what? Covenant. covenant. That's an agreement. He keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and do what? Amen. So you see, God, you see man's part? What is man's part in this? They have to do what? Keep the commandments of God. This, this is so important. Verse 10. And repayeth them that hate him to their face, to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him, and will repay him to his face. Verse 11, and thou shalt therefore keep the what? Amen. Keep the commandments and the what? Amen. And the what? Amen. Which I command you this day to do them. Verse 12, wherefore it shall come to pass. Now let's read this next word together. A little tiny word, but it's very powerful. If, if, if you do what? If you hearken to my judgments and keep my commandments, and do them that the Lord thy God shall do what? He shall keep unto thee the what? The covenant and the mercy which he swear unto thy fathers. So that word if is a conditional word. If you do this, I will do that. If you keep your part of the covenant, I will keep my part of the covenant. Are you with me? So this shows that it was conditional. Their part was to obey God's commandments statutes and judgments and God says if you do that I will fight your enemies for you I will bless you I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you and you shall be a great and mighty nation and I didn't choose you because of your ethnicity uh oh you know because you know they're, they're Hebrew Israelites in Greenville now you know that I saw it for the first time for the first time, I was, I, was, I was coming downtown, and I saw some guys on the street 
with their little posters and all that. And I said, oh no, they, they're now here in the city of Greenville. And they're spewing this, this doctrine of hate and, this, and, and exclusivity, which we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna undo that this morning. There's no such thing as salvation by ethnicity. And there's no such thing as salvation by pedigree. There's no such thing as salvation by pigmentation or skin color. There's no such thing. God loves everybody. And when he died on the cross, he died for how many? Amen. For God so loved the world, Amen. he gave his only begotten son. Amen. That whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Heaven will be comprised of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Am I telling the truth? Amen. And so when you see this sort of thing, you know, it's, it's very fascinating. So now, the Lord says, if you want to be in relationship with me, you must keep my commandments. So it was more about character and commandment keeping than it was about anything else. The Lord said, I didn't even choose you because you were so many people, because you were large. He said, in fact, you were the smallest. There was nothing about you special that made me choose you. I chose you because your father did what I told him to do. Are you with me? And guess how God will choose in this last hour? The same way. He's the same yesterday. He's the same today, and he will, he's going to be the same way tomorrow. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Now, let's look at another one. Now, go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Since we're in Deuteronomy, we're just moving along. Deuteronomy 30. And watch what it says here in Deuteronomy 30. And we're going to begin at verse 15. Am I in the right place? Deuteronomy 30 and verse 15. Notice what it says here. The Lord says, See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil, in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God and to walk in his ways and to do what? Keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments that thou mayest live and do what? multiply, and the Lord thy God shall do what? Bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Now watch this word again. But if thine heart turn away so that thou wilt not hear, and, but shalt be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall utterly what? Perish. Now, how can you get out of that? God has to keep his part no matter what. You understand where I'm going with this? God says, if you don't do this, I will utterly denounce you to a point where you're going to perish. So this means I'm not keeping my part of the covenant. Why? Because you're not keeping your part. Are you with me? And the Lord says, that ye shall, uh, shall, shall perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whether thou goest to possess it over Jordan. Verse 19, I called heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curses. Therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God, uh, 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 and that thou mayest obey his voice, there's that O word, and that thou mayest cleave unto him, for he is thy life and the length of thy days, that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. Do you see the conditionality in this passage? If you do this, I will do this. But if you turn away, you start worshiping other gods, it's not, it's not going to turn out. It's not going to turn out good. So this is the covenant that the Lord made with Abram and later changed his name to Abraham. What we're looking at here in Deuteronomy, what we've looked at was the Mosaic covenant. So God is reiterating the covenant 
as time passes on with the children of Israel. Started with Abram, now he's reiterating it with Moses. Are you with me? Amen. Now, we're going to go down in time and we're going to look at how the Lord did it with David. There's this thing called the Davidic covenant. Go with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Please say amen when you found it. 2 Samuel 7. And we're going to read verse 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 16. So we looked at Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant. We looked at the Mosaic covenant. Now we're looking at the Davidic covenant. God reiterates the covenant with David. 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. Are we there? Let's read together. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established for how long? Forever before thee, thy throne shall be established for how long? Forever. So, and then what happened is a lot of the evangelicals in the Christian world read this verse and they said, oh, the Lord gave a covenant to David. And this is the one that they always want to use. They don't want to look at the Mosaic Covenant. They don't want to look at the Abrahamic Covenant. They want to look at the Davidic Covenant. And you know why? Because they said, see, there's no conditions. They said there's no conditions. And God has to fulfill everything he said. And there's no conditions. So in other words, no matter what they do, they're always going to be the people of God. Is that true? Yeah. No, it's not true. And so, and it's true when you read this verse, there are no conditions mentioned, but that don't mean there are no conditions. Because whereas you may not find it here, you can find it elsewhere. And we're going to show you that there were conditions placed upon them. So go with me now to uh, second, 1 Kings chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2. You have 2 Samuel, then you have 1 Kings, and go to 1 Kings chapter 2. In, this, in that passage we just read, it is true that you don't see the conditions of the covenant, but now I'm going to show you the conditions. And David himself is going to tell Solomon, because you remember David wanted to build the temple of the Lord, right? And the Lord said, no, I can't let you do that because you got too much blood on your hands. Because he killed Uriah, uh, uh, Bathsheba's husband, and he, had, he was a man of war. And the Lord says, no, he says, but I'll let you assemble all the materials, but I'll let your son, who's going to reign in your stead after you die, Solomon, I'm going to let him build it, but I'll let you get all the materials together. And David was fine with that. So now David is about to die, and he's talking to Solomon, and he's giving him a charge, and I want you to hear what David says. Since they say, oh, there's no conditions on David, on his covenant, well, let's see. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to begin at verse 1. The Bible says, Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth, meaning I'm about to die. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. You see the conditions? To walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of who? Moses. So in other words, David is saying, the same conditions that was in the Mosaic law is in the covenant that the Lord made with me. He says that, that as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in the land that thou, uh, 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 in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself, that the Lord may continue his word, which he spake concerning who? Me, saying that, talking about David, saying, what's the next word? Yeah. If, if thy children take heed to their way to walk before me in truth and, in all their, and with all their hearts and with all their soul, and there shall not fail thee, he said, a man on the throne in Israel. Isn't that something? So, so there were conditions. It just wasn't mentioned in 2 Samuel 7. But they, it was implied. It was automatically understood because David is now talking to Solomon. He's saying, hey, 
keep these things. Keep these things. Now, did, did, did Solomon stray off the path? He married all those women, and what happened? He, he, he got off the path. He started putting up idol, idols to, their, to his wives, gods, and all this kind of stuff. And so he kind of fell off um, a little bit. Uh, well, a lot. All right, now listen. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 6, since we're in 1 Kings. And I want you to hear what Solomon has to say. And the word comes to Solomon. Go to chapter 6, and we're going to begin at verse 11. 1 Kings chapter 6, and beginning at verse 11. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto Solomon, saying, Concerning the house which thou art in, uh, in building, talking about the, the construction of the temple, what's that next word? If thou will do what? Walk in my statutes and execute my judgments and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto who? David, David your father, I, in the Davidic covenant. The same covenant that Moses had is the same covenant that David had. Now it's the same covenant I'm giving to you. Right? It's amazing. It's amazing. Verse 13, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. So this is very powerful. So the Lord is showing us that there were conditions to these covenants. Well, the rest of the Christian world says, no, 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 there are no conditions. And the rest of the Christian world, the Protestant world, teaches that the 144,000 are literal Jews and God is going to restore Israel in Palestine so he can fulfill all those promises he made even if they don't even believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Now, I'm going to show you some scriptures that debunks all of this. Now, notice what it says in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6 here on the screen. The Lord in the Old Testament said, my people are destroyed for a lack of what? A lack of, a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. And the Lord says, I will also forget thy children. Does that sound like God has to bless them no matter what they do? See, see they make it sound like that God is obligated. He has to keep all of his promises because they came out of his mouth. Well, he, when he brought it out of his mouth, he also brought out the conditions. He says, if, if you do this, I will do this. But if you don't do this, I will forget you. Amen. You forget me, I'll forget you. Amen. I will also forget thy children. As they were increased, so they sinned against me. Therefore will I change their glory into what? Shame. Into shame. So it's very, very interesting. So we all know about this prophecy that's in the book of Daniel. The prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. And in this prophecy of Daniel, we already covered this, so we won't go through it again. But I just want to emphasize it here for a second. In Daniel chapter 9, the Lord told them, I'm going to allow you to leave Babylon to go back to your homeland to restore and rebuild the temple. All right? And the Lord says, I'm going to put a, 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 a time frame on you of this 70-week uh, prophecy. And the Lord says, you have to put away sin and you have to anoint the most holy, talking about Jesus Christ, and the Lord says they need to get their stuff together as his covenant people. Or the Lord is going to say, adios, amigos. My wife's smiling. That's my Spanish for the day. <laughs> He's going to say adios. And so we know the prophecy. The temple was started in 457 B.C. And then if you go... 490 years or 480 years, the first 69 weeks, the Messiah showed up. Um, uh, he was baptized by John in the River Jordan. And then that last week, that 70th week, this is when Christ was crucified in the midst of the week. And then three and a half years later, the gospel was still supposed to go to the Jewish nation. And then after they stoned Stephen on AD 34, that's when the gospel went to the Gentiles. The Bible says it was meet that the gospel should have been preached unto you. But since you deem yourselves unworthy, 
Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Now, do you know the modern day Jews that are over in Palestine today, do you know that they have placed the curse on their people that, so that they won't study this prophecy? Because if you study this prophecy, they'll realize that the Messiah is here. Do you know that they're still looking for the Messiah to come? And they said the Messiah was not Jesus Christ. And they're saying that a, the, the Messiah is still coming and he has not come yet. How can God keep a covenant with somebody who's absolutely, completely rejected his son? Does that make any sense? Do you want to see the, do you want to see the curse? I found it. I had a hard time finding it. I used to be on the internet, and remember years ago I preached on this, and I was able to find it easily. Now they have scrubbed the, 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 the Google search engine. You can hardly find it, but I was actually fortunate enough to find it. And this is in the Talmud. And it says, why is there a rabbinic curse? This was an article that I found. And this is the Babylonian, they call it the Babylonian Talmud. This is their extra biblical writings, that they, all the stuff that they put on their people. And this is the curse. It said, blasted be the bones of those who calculate the end on anyone who attempts to understand the prophecy found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 26 of the Holy Scriptures. So they said, you're cursed if you, they don't want their people studying this. You know why? Because many people who, who are of that faith have studied it and they wound up leaving and becoming Messianic Jews and believing on Jesus Christ. Are you with me? But they don't want their people studying it because they know that they're gonna start uh, leaving. Now, here's some words from Jesus himself about whether or not his covenant is permanent no matter what. Now listen, when you read Matthew 21 and 43, Jesus says to Israel, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Does that sound like the Lord has to bless you no matter what you do? It, it was almost like an Israelite once saved, always saved kind of doctrine. And you know what? That same doctrine is floating around in Christendom today. You know, it has entered even into the Adventist church. Are you with me? Once saved, always, no matter what you do, God has to keep his word. No, he, it's conditional. Is it conditional with you? If I leave here today, after having preached this, this gospel the way I have preached it, and I go out there and I live like a fool, and I say, you know what? I'm just going to go out here. I'm just going to live it up. I'm going to have me a good time. And I die in the process. Is God still obligated to save me? Because I once upon a time preached the gospel? Absolutely not. He's not obligated to me in any way, shape, or form. You know why? Because I walked away. Because I walked away. That makes the whole covenant null and void. Am I telling the truth? This is clear, isn't it? The Lord says, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Look, let's go there real quick. Go, go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Matthew 21. I want you to look at it. This is the parable about the, the wicked husbandman. The wicked husbandman. And this is when the Lord <clears throat> talks about how there was a vineyard that he had and he let it out to husbandmen and what they did with, with it. Uh, verse 33, Matthew 21. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it round about and dig a wine press in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruit of it. And the husbandman took the, his servant and beat one and killed another and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto them likewise. But last of all, he sent unto them who? His son, saying, they will do what? They will reverence my son. 
But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him and they cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord, therefore, of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto the husbandmen? And they said, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruit in their, you know, they, if they had known what they were saying, they, they would, if they had known this was about them, they probably wouldn't answer it so fast, right? And so they know the answer, right? Verse 42, and Jesus said unto them, never, did ye never hear in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. And this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be what? Taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. This is so powerful. And this is what Jesus is talking about. The kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Matthew 8, verses 10 through 12. When Jesus heard it, talking about the centurion's faith, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. I say unto you that many shall come from the east and from the west and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Can you imagine that? The Lord is emphasizing. He said they're going to come from the east. And you know what, you know what he's saying? These are going to be Gentiles. <laughs> they're going to come from the east and the west and the north and the south. And they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. He said, but y'all are going to be cast out in the outer darkness. But the children, why? The Lord is emphasizing this to Israel because they had but a short time. He knew they were going to crucify him. He knew that the gospel was still going to go to them another three and a half years after his crucifixion. But then at that point, they were no longer going to be recognized as the people of God. You know why? Because God only recognizes those that obey him. Am I telling the truth? He only recognizes those that obey him. This is the bottom line, brothers and sisters. Now watch this. This is Prophet and King. So... In Revelation 7, we're not talking about literal Israel. These are not literal Hebrews. First of all, like I said, 722 B.C., 10 tribes got dispersed all over the world. So it's impossible to figure out who is Israel today. Now, patriarchs and uh, prophets and kings, 713 to 715, watch this. The prophet shows that Literal Israel is no longer literal Israel. We're now dealing with spiritual Israel. Are you with me? That which God purposed to do for the world through Israel, the chosen nation, he will finally accomplish through what? His church on earth today. He has let out his vineyard under other husbandmen, even to his covenant-keeping people who faithfully render him the fruits in their season. Never has the Lord been without a true representative representatives on this earth who have made his interest their own. These witnesses for God are numbered among what? Spiritual Israel. And to them will be fulfilled all the covenant promises made by Jehovah to his ancient people. To spiritual Israel have been restored the privileges accorded to the people of God at the time of their deliverance from Babylon. So all those promises, all of those blessings God promised ancient Israel, guess who's going to receive them? Spiritual Israel. Are you with me? Now, let's bear this out. Let's bear this out from the word of God. Go with me real quick to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. We, we looked at Old Testament. Now we're going to look at some things in the New Testament, and we'll try to wrap this up. We'll try to land this plane without anybody getting hurt. Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. Notice what it says beginning at verse 28. When you're there, please say amen. amen. Romans chapter 2. Paul here is talking to the Christian church. 
Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But God told him, I want you also to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And so watch what Paul says about his beloved nation, Israel. He says, verse 28 of chapter 2, are we together? Let's read together. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is an outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So Paul here is saying God is no longer recognizing ethnic Israel. I thought I would get one amen. Amen. He's not recognizing ethnic Israel. He's recognizing those who are in a covenant relationship with him through obedience of the truth. Are you with me? Amen. Paul made it clear. He said he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Because remember, circumcision once upon a time was their seal. We talked about that on last Sabbath. It was their seal. It was the seal of their covenant. They would go and get circumcised, and that was part of the covenant deal that they had with the Lord. But Paul here is saying, now, listen, none of that matters anymore. Because of one man, because of Jesus Christ, all have access to the covenant blessings. Are you with me? Now, stay in Romans. Stay in the book of Romans. And now let's go to chapter 9. Chapter 9 of Romans. Notice with me, beginning with verse 1. Romans chapter 9, beginning with first, the first verse. Paul says, I say the truth in Christ, and I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that I, that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, meaning the Hebrew people. But what is he saying? <clears throat> he sounded like Moses. Moses ran to the Lord when they were sinning against him. The Lord, Moses said, Lord, don't blot them out of your book. Blot my name out of your book. Lest the wicked say you couldn't deliver this people. You know, and Paul said, I could wish myself a curse for my, for my Israelite family. I could, verse 3, wish myself a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the what? And the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers and of whom are concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all and God bless forever. Amen. He said even Christ was an Israelite, but notice verse 6. But not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What is Paul saying? The gospel is going to everyone now. And all those who believe in Jesus Christ, they are part of Israel now. Are you with me? Notice what it says in verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. In other words, if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are now part of the family of Israel. Notice what it says in chapter 10. Chapter 10, look at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now go to chapter 11. Notice what it says in verse 1 of chapter 11. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I am also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. He said God has not cast them off. God has not cast them off so that they can't be saved is what he's saying. They can be saved, but they have to accept Jesus Christ. They must accept Jesus Christ, and this is so important. And then as you continue reading in chapter 11, Paul gives this an analogy of an olive tree, and he calls Israel the original olive tree, and he says the Gentiles 
were like a wild olive tree. And he says, but some of the branches of the original tree got broken off because of unbelief. And he says, and you Gentiles being a wild olive tree, you were grafted in. And then he goes on to tell them, he says, now listen, don't be high-minded because if God spared not the original branches because of unbelief, they didn't keep their part of the covenant. Don't be high-minded. Don't boast lest he spare you not also. Are you with me? And he says, because if the original stock comes back to the original tree, it can easily be grafted in again. Amen? Amen? Let's look at it. Notice what it says in verse 26. And then he says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away the ungodliness from Jacob. And it says in verse 27, For this is my covenant unto them. There's that covenant word again. This is the agreement when I shall take away their sins. And he's done that through Jesus Christ. Are you with me? He's done that through his son, Jesus Christ. Now listen, go to chapter, uh, let's go to Galatians. Galatians, we're almost done. Go to Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 3. A familiar passage of scripture that we all know. Galatians chapter 3, and notice what it says, starting with verse 26. Galatians 3, 26, the Bible says, for ye are all the children of God by what? By faith in who? Christ Jesus. For as many of you as has been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now watch this, verse 28. Let's read together. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Isn't that something? Amen. Look at chapter 4. Go to chapter 4 and look at verse 28. The next chapter over. Verse 28 says, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of the promise, meaning the Gentiles, the Galatians, all the Christian world are also heirs of the promise. Go to chapter 6 of Galatians. Chapter 6, notice what it says in verse 16. Verse 16 of Galatians 6, And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the what? The Israel of God. The Bible is even calling them the Israel of God. The Israel of God. Fascinating. Fascinating. And even in the book of James, chapter 1 and verse 1, you can just write it down, the Bible refers to the Christian world as the 12 tribes of Israel. James gives his greeting to the Christian world. He says, greetings to my brethren, to the 12 tribes of Israel that are scattered abroad. Now, I have a video clip here I want to show you, and I just want to show you a, a, a very popular, very prominent Protestant minister who's pro-Israel, pro-Israel, pro-Israel. And I want you to notice two things. I actually have two clips. In the first clip, you're going to notice that they believe that these are God's people no matter what, even if they don't accept Jesus. And you're going to hear him say that the Davidic covenant is still intact to this day. And we just showed that it is not, and even that was conditional. So... Let me get some more volume on that. We are united in the belief that Jerusalem is the city of God. It is the place of our spiritual heritage. It is the place where Jeremiah and Isaiah uttered moral and spiritual principles that shaped the standards of righteousness for the nations of the world. We are united that Jerusalem is the only city on earth that by its very existence declares there is a God. Yes. We are united that the Jewish people are a chosen people. They are a cherished people. They are the apple of God's eye. They are a covenant people. And that eternal covenant to the land of Israel has never been broken and stands back today. 
and we just clearly show that that's not true. It's all conditional. If you don't accept Christ, you can't receive the promise. You can't receive the promise. Now, let's look at here on the screen here. This is uh, Prophets and Kings 6, uh, 367. And it says, to Isaiah, it was given to make very plain to Judah the truth that among, is that among the Israel of God were to be numbered many who were not descendants of Abraham after the flesh. So this is clear. They were gonna, Isaiah the prophet prophesied a bunch about God's house being a house of prayer for all people. And it was not a popular thing to say in his time. Go with me to Isaiah 56 real quick. Isaiah 56. Just give me a few more minutes and we'll, we'll let you out of here. Isaiah 56. Isaiah was prophesying these things at a time when saying these things were not that popular. And, but he prophesied it anyway. Many of the other prophets uh, talked about these things too, but Isaiah more than any other. Isaiah 56. And notice what it says, how God is going to give salvation to all people. Isaiah 56, we're going to begin at verse 1 when you're there. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Keep ye judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this and the son of man that layeth hold on it and keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it. You see the Sabbath is also connected in it because remember that's the sign, right? That's the seal. And keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger. When it says the son of the stranger, that's talking about foreigners, people who were not ethnic Jews, right? Neither let the son of the stranger that have joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith the Lord unto the eunuchs that do what? Keep my Sabbaths. What does it say? And choose the things that please me and take hold of my what? Covenant. And come into agreement with me. Even them will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than of the sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name and they shall not be cut off. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Yes. Notice what it says in verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves unto the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant, even them will I bring in my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon mine altars. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer for how many people? For all people. For all people. And the Lord says, this is what I want to do. And the Lord wanted to do this through the nation of Israel. But guess what happened? They became exclusive. They became a club unto themselves. They, were, they wanted all the blessings of God, but they didn't want to include any other nations. They looked down on other nations. By the time, so much so, by the time Christ got here, it was unlawful for a Jew to go under the roof of a Gentile. God had to get that prejudice out of them. God had to get that prejudice out of Peter. Remember, the Lord had to give Peter a vision. A sheep came down with all these unclean animals, and the Lord says, Peter, rise, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. Nothing ever unclean or common has ever come to my mouth. And so the Lord says, I'm not talking about food, Peter. I'm talking about people. If I'm cleansing these people, don't you call them common or unclean. And the Lord gave him that revelation. And that's when he had to give up his prejudice and he started giving the gospel to the world just like Paul was doing. Just like Paul. You know, Paul, and they almost had a throwdown over this thing. Peter, when the, he was all right with the Gentiles until the Jews came around. When he came around, he, he, he would slide from their table and he would go over there with the Jews. And Paul confronted them to the other. They, they, they had contentions over this thing. Are you with me? Now watch this. So Isaiah, to Isaiah was given to make very plain to Judah the truth that among the Israel of God were to be a numbered many who were not descendants of Abraham after the flesh. 
This teaching was not in harmony with the theology of his age. Yet he fearlessly proclaimed the message given to him of God and brought hope to many longing heart, uh, a longing heart reaching out after the spiritual blessings promised to the seed of Abraham. The spirit of God was to be poured out upon how much flesh? All flesh. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness were to be numbered among the Israel of God. They shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourses, said the prophets. One shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, which is the same as Israel. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself after the name of Israel. Isaiah 44, 4 and 5. Now watch this. Second volume of the testimonies, 109. I was shown that those who are trying to obey God and purify their souls through obedience to the truth are God's chosen people, his modern Israel. God says of them through Peter, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So here's the other clip that I was telling you about, and I want you to hear closely that they believe that they're God's people no matter what. From you, that you somehow got it when it comes to your care and concern about the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, my care and concern comes from comes from my care and concern comes from the Bible. Anyone who is a Bible believer has a heart for Israel. Israel is not a political issue. Israel is a Bible issue. It begins in Genesis 1 and 1, where God created the earth. He owned the earth as the owner of the earth made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's repeated 17 times in the Old Testament. That God gave a specific land to a specific people in an eternal covenant. And that covenant is good today and will be good in the future. It really doesn't matter what the United States of America wants, what the United Nations want, what the quartet wants. God wants the Jewish people to have the land of Israel, to have it in peace, and it is our opportunity to work toward that goal. If there was one thing you wish Americans in general understood better about Israel, then what would it be? Uh, the thing that uh, the American people need to understand about Israel is that they are a free and democratic nation. They have the right to exist. They have the right to defend themselves. They have the right to secure borders. They have the right to rule the city of Jerusalem. They have the right to build wherever they want to build in Judea and Samaria or Jerusalem. The President of the United States has no authority to tell the Jewish people what they can and cannot do in the city of Jerusalem. The people of Israel have the right to their divine destiny and for them to determine what it is, determine what it is, not for us. One more question for you, and again, I want to, it's the hardest question I could ask you. You know, there, is, there has been an entire history of, in the past, difficulties between the Christian community and the Jewish community. You addressed that at APAC, and you have spoken out against anti-Semitism. There are some Jews in the Jewish community who still worry that evangelical Christians are only supportive of the Jewish presence in Israel because you hope one day you will be able, as a community, to convert the Jewish people to a love for Jesus Christ. Would you please address that for us? From your perspective, how real is that inside you? To what extent should it or should not be a concern for American Jewry? Uh, I cannot speak for every Christian in the world, but I can certainly speak for myself and Christians United for Israel. Our objective is to help Israel right now in the most dangerous moment they've experienced since statehood. I know that Christians and Jews have difference in belief over who Jesus Christ is. We believe he's Messiah, the Jewish people do not. But as I tell my rabbi friends, especially the Orthodox friend, uh, Rabbi Scheinberg in San Antonio, let's agree to disagree. 
and let's work together for the benefit of Israel. And one day when we're standing in the streets of Jerusalem and Messiah is coming down the road, one of us is going to have a terrific theological adjustment to make. I believe it's him, he believe it's me. But until then, let's agree to disagree and join hands in behalf of Israel and in defense of Israel because Israel really needs our help right now. You are making a marvelous contribution on the American scene and for the Christian community. It is really, again, an honor to speak to you. One day I want to sit in the studio with you. I want to find out how John Hagee became John Hagee. But right now, I wish you all the best, and I thank you for this moment on Shalom TV. Thank you, Mark. Blessings to you. John Hagee. So in other words, it doesn't matter they don't believe in Jesus, or does it? Listen, Jesus says, I am the door. No man comes through the Father except through me. You know, you don't receive the blessings unless you go through Jesus. You understand what I'm saying? You know, and so it's very, very interesting. All right, let's, start, let's wrap this up. All right, so this is early writings. I found this in the book, not early writings, I'm sorry. I found this in the book Evangelism. And this is what is being predicted as what's going to happen, and what was happening in her day and what's going to continue to happen. Jews being numbered with the Israel of God. In this our day, we see the Gentiles beginning to rejoice with the Jews. There are convert, converted Jews who are now laboring in blank and in various other cities in behalf of their own people. The Jews are coming into the ranks of God's chosen followers and are being numbered with the Israel of God. So the Israel of God, she's calling the Christian church. The Christian church, not the Israel land of Palestine or not the ethnic Jew. The Israel of God, according to the prophet, is God's church. And these Jews are coming into God's church. Are you understanding? All right, so the Jews are coming into the ranks of God's chosen followers and are being numbered with the Israel of God in these closing days. Thus, some of the Jews will once more be reinstated with the people of God, and the blessing of the Lord will rest upon them richly if they will come into the position of rejoicing that is re represented in the scripture. And again, he saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. Um, and last one, solemn are the lessons of Israel's failure during the years when ruler and people turn from the high purpose they have been called to fulfill. You know, they crucified the Savior. Wherein they were weak even to the point of failure, the Israel of God today, talking about the Christian church, the representatives of heaven that make up the true church of Christ must be strong. So where they fail, we must, they were weak, we must be strong. For upon them devolves the task of finishing the work that has been committed to man and of ushering in the day of final awards. So God has a church, brothers and sisters. And the 144,000 are not literal Jews. It is made up of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And it's so powerful, brothers and sisters. They are arrayed in white, and they come from everywhere and they have accepted Jesus Christ and they keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Are you with me? Amen. Who believes God's word this morning? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this study. Uh, Father, we know that we can spend all of our time trying to find out whether or not it's literal, whether or not it's symbolic. When it doesn't matter, it's a character issue. Help us, Lord, to have that seal, the seal of God in our foreheads and the Father's character in our hearts, dear Lord that we may be like him, transformed into his very image. And so, Father, I pray, dear Lord, that you will help us as we seek your face day after day, Sabbath after Sabbath, through prayer and through study and through sincere heart examination and through sincere heart surrender. And I pray, dear Lord, that you will give us this seal that we may be your children, your faithful ones, so that we may stand with you on Mount Zion on that great day. We thank you, Father, for hearing us. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. amen.